Good morning. Happy Easter.
a special song for you. Okay, so yesterday was Love Life. We just wanted to give an update because I know this church was praying. I know you guys pray. And the church showed up in great numbers yesterday at the abortion clinic too. So thank you to everybody. Um, this last week, 16 babies were saved because you were praying. Awesome. And 10 of those babies were in Charlotte alone, which is amazing. And also we heard that on Thursday, the abortion clinic that we went out to, the, the biggest abortion clinic, was completely closed. The counselors showed up. Nobody was there for no reason. Like, they never do that. But your prayers were answered. Awesome. Yeah, um, there was one guy there, and I know several people talked about him. He was on the other side, and he was trying to distract us. And I just want us to be praying for this guy. His name is Reggie. And we all believe that he is going to know the Lord, that he's going to turn around, and he's going to love children. So just keep, on, keep praying for Reggie. And I just want to honor whoever prayed this week, whoever went on the prayer walk, it doesn't matter. I know there are so many prayer warriors. Would you just stand, and we would just want to honor you for your prayers. 
and anybody who has prayed this entire week. You didn't have to go on yeah. on the prayer walk. If you were praying, if you came, yeah. We just thank you so much. I, I know there's, the Lord was there, his presence was there, and just the fact that Latrobe, the largest abortion clinic possibly in the entire nation, was shut down on a weekday is just amazing. Yes. So thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. It was awesome. And I know that we made a difference yesterday and this whole week because it was, well, it's God who did it, but your prayers mattered. And thank you for praying. Thank you for standing for life when not many churches will stand there and for standing in the gap on this Easter weekend when we were the only church out there. So thank you so much again for everything and to God be the glory. Thank you, Shay and Joseph. It is. I, I am so proud of this church. I'm so proud of our young folks who stepped up and who led worship yesterday. Uh, what an amazing time it was to see them up there, to see everybody that had come out. And there were some other individuals there with us. And, you know, what a time to do that on Easter weekend. Uh, the victory that has been won um, you know, it's just amazing to see um, everything that the Lord did yesterday. And uh, I, uh, I, I was just so humbled to be a part of that. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else but there yesterday. Uh, and and, and uh, thank you, church, for representing us. Thank you for praying. Thank you for supporting Love Life. Uh, they are such a, a great group uh, of people and I just uh, you know I just can't tell you how full my heart was to see everyone there and to be a part of that happy resurrection day he's risen right yeah he's risen indeed and you know what the victory's ours because the victory was his so many years uh, ago We've been in a series called Why the Cross, and we're going to be in our last message in this series this morning, and I want to speak with you about why the cross, the resurrection victory, the resurrection victory. We're going to be in Luke 24, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 12 this morning. John Updike said this, he stated this, make no mistake about it. If he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fail. I want you to think about it. It's a whole different kind of thought about the resurrection. But what he's saying is this. He's saying that if Jesus' body did not physically resurrect, then our faith is in vain. He goes on and he says, let's not mock God with metaphors, analogy, sidestepping, transcendence, making an event a parable, a sign painted in a faded cruelty of early ages, but let us walk through the door. What door is he talking about? The door that he is talking about is the door of truth. That's the door that he's talking about. Truth that uh, corresponds to reality. That's what truth is. Truth corresponds to the reality. 
does the resurrection of Jesus Christ correspond with reality as we know it? Absolutely it does. That's why we're here, and that's why we can be victorious. Did Jesus Christ raise in the same physical body that he died with on the cross? Did he? Did Christ really raise from the dead? Was the resurrection physical in nature, or was it just spiritual? If Christ had not risen from the dead physically, would there be redemption of sins? Do you know that two-thirds of Americans who believe or who are believers say there, there will not be a physical resurrection of their bodies? That's astounding, folks. That, that just, when I read that, that just threw me back. They believe we will be disembodied spirits in the world to come. There will be no physical resurrection or no physical body after we die. Is there really victory in the resurrection? Is the tomb really empty? Did the disciples and the eyewitnesses really see Jesus? If they really did see him, then what does it mean to those who believe or are seeking him about the truth this morning? The physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of redemption. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, our faith is in vain. We don't need to be here this morning. We don't need to come on Wednesday night. We don't need to go to Love Life on Saturday. We don't need to come in on Sunday mornings. All of it's just in vain. We're just wasting our time. If it were all a hoax, we were people who are to be pitied. We'd have no hope. We'd all be lost. We'd have no answer for eternity. Look with me in Luke as he records Resurrection Sunday. Luke 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Now, he's talking about the ladies, right? So right at dawn, right at sunrise... Here they go. They're walking towards the tomb. They already knew that their Savior had died. Everything that they had believed in was in the grave. They didn't understand. They were grieving. They were coming to prepare his body for burial. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. That's a good little sentence to underline right there. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, they were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. Now, before I go on, I just want to let you know, look what the apostles said. These are the guys that walked with Jesus, who was uh, in his group or who were in his group, who watched the miracles, who watched him do all of his works and listened to all of his teachings. Look what they said. But these words appeared to them as what? nonsense they didn't believe they said huh -uh, that's nonsense 
Is that what you think this morning? Do you think that the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection, is that nonsense to you? And they would not believe them. Goodness. Man, how can we explain that? But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went in away. Uh, he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. So you know what? They didn't have that time to properly embalm Jesus. They they went on it. They couldn't do it on the Sabbath, so they were waiting until Sunday morning. They came in. They were talking. They said, "Who's going to roll this stone away from us or for us?" Who's going to roll the stone away for us? What are we going to do? So they got to the tomb, tomb and it was empty. And who were there? Who was there? Two angels, right? Two angels, two dazzling men in white, basically, and said, hey, what are you doing here? Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. And they reported it to those apostles, and they said, that's nonsense. There's no way. He's got to be there. We watched everyone put him there. He's got to be there. They didn't believe. But then the greatest words of hope that still echo down the, through the halls of time was spoken by the angel at that empty tomb. And here, here's the words. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has arose questions of long ago and even today you see here, here, here it goes back to that survey of two-thirds of believers who don't think that their bodies are going to be raised physically they say if a man dies will he live again if a man dies in this day and age will he actually live again it's the same question that applies today Death is a prominent question for many in the past ages as well as in the forefront of today's mind. Many people want to ask this question about death. What happens after death? Then what happens? Is there an eternity? Do we all shut down just like computers and, and, and that's the end of it? Or, or are we all going? And if we're all going, then how is that going to look like? You see, it's a mystery and, and, and it's unknown because we don't know what to expect when we die. Even believers say this to me. I don't know what to expect. We have to face it alone. We're scared because we say we have to face it alone. It, it's individual. We're separated from our loved ones. Will we meet again? You see, there's a big thing there. Will, will I see my loved ones again? You know, that's, that's something big for us. Our personal goals or our dreams, we're not going to realize it because we're, we're, we're either going to die or, or we're on our way to death. Folks, death is unavoidable. Every one of us in here is going to face it unless the Lord comes back. So does Jesus' death and resurrection truly answer these questions? Is it true? Is Jesus really who he says he is? Did he truly die? Is the tomb empty? Can we have the victory over death that, that we preach about all the time or that we talk about? Is that really true? Well, let's investigate this just for a minute, okay? So in verse 7 of chapter 24, it says the Son of Man. Who is that Son of Man? Well, the Son of Man is Jesus Christ, the unique Son of God. Christ was born. Jesus was a historical person, just like you and me. He was a historical person. There's, there's multiple eyewitness accounts of Jesus. There's multiple manuscripts evidence of saying that he walked this earth. There's, there's multiple archaeological finds that, that say that he lived in that time and place. So he was a historical person, and he walked this earth a little over 2,000 years ago. He is the God-man. He was 100% God, 100% man. How can that be? He was born of a virgin. How can that be? 
He was born pure and sinless. That's how he can be 100% God and 100% man. You see, he, he had to come among his, his, his creation to, to build that bridge between heaven and earth. He was different from any other man to walk the face of the earth. In fact, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says this. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's you and I, he himself, who's himself? That's Jesus. Likewise, also partook of the same, of the same what? Flesh and blood. And that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Yes, we do have an enemy. He's very real. He's a spiritual being, and he's called Satan. He's called, a, he's called the devil, the accuser, the liar, the father of this world. And might free those who through what? The fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That's why Jesus came. That's who he uh, is and why he came to the earth, is he was God in flesh who came just like the creation that he created so that he may, what, render death powerless. You hear my words this morning? Are you afraid of death this morning? Hope not. Because you know what? If you're a Christian and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is no fear of death. There should be no fear of death. Christ came for man and he died on man's behalf. Why? Because man is sinful, right? Sin. We all have missed the mark. We've all went against God's standards. We've all stepped across the line of the standards that he has set for us. We go beyond the limits set. Those are the moral principles. You say, well, you know what? I'm a good man or woman. No, you're not. You already stepped across the line because you're not, and I'm not, and nobody in this world is, not, is, is good. How come we know that? Because Jesus tells us that, you know what? The heart is wicked, out of it comes all kinds of stuff. That we're wicked, that we were conceived in sin. We are sinful people who crossed God's standards. And because of that, what, did we, what do we deserve? We deserve deads, death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. We cannot save ourselves. You cannot be good enough. You cannot give enough money. You cannot... Uh, go and do a, enough works. There's no way in your life or in my life that we can save ourselves. When you walk past the book aisle, you'll, say, you'll see 10 steps to self-help, 10 steps to be a good man, 10 steps to be a good woman. That's not going to save you. Just because you've come to church all your life and just because your mom and your dad's a, a, a good person or because your kid uh, you know, uh, has come and, 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 and is a Christian, it's not going to save you. That's a personal relationship. That's a personal decision that you have to make on your own. Your grandma, your granddad, your great-grandma, your great-granddad, just because the church has been here for a thousand years doesn't mean that you're saved unless you've come to that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He died on the cross of Calvary. Jesus came and fulfilled the law so that he could take on the wrath of God for us. God loves us. That's God's love for humanity. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, came to redeem us, you and me, this world, and, uh, from, a, from the marketplace of sin. Blood covered, his blood covered our sin of unbelief, and he reconciled man to God. So we could have life and not judgment. You know what? If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as, as your Lord and Savior, you're going to face the judgment. We don't like to hear that, right? We don't like to hear that we're going to give an account to God himself. 
but you're going to. You're going to come before his throne, and he's going to break out the books, and he's going to judge you on your deeds and works. And while you may have some decent works and deeds, he's going to open the book of life, and he's going to say, is his name or her name recorded in it? No. And you know what? The judgment's going to be eternal separation. Because God loves you enough to know that if you don't want to live for him down here, you don't want to live for him in eternity. And he's not going to put you somewhere where you don't want to be. It's your choice. So when we looked at all of this series of why the cross what we were looking at and what we uh, learned was that there was forgiveness there's assurance there's compassion there's anguish there's suffering and there's victory and I thank the Lord for the victory that we have I thank the Lord today that I had the victory over death that I have the joy. Yes, there may be sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. So did Christ rise from the dead physically? So we, we talk about the cross the last five or so weeks. He's in the grave. Now we come and the tomb is empty and we have to ask, answer the question, what is the evidence of a physical resurrection? There's overwhelming evidence for the physical resurrection. Did you know that? Overwhelming evidence. He was what? First of all, he was touched by human hands. He was touched by human hands. All we have to do is we look in John 20, 27, and he, what? All the disciples are in the upper room. He walks through or he appears in the, in the locked room, and he appears to the disciples, and they're all happy and everything, but Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas, who was a skeptic, who had questions, Uh, they come and and told him, they said, hey, you know what? Uh, The Lord has risen. We've seen him. He was in the upper room. I will not believe unless I can put my hand in his side, feel the nails, where the nails went through his wrist. A week later, they were in the upper room, and what happened? Thomas was there, and Thomas uh, was taken aback when Jesus appeared, and Jesus came to him, and he said, what? Put your hand right here in my side. And what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. You see, that's physical. That, that you can't touch a spirit, y'all. Pardon the southern slang, okay? You can't touch a spirit. How about Mary at the tomb in John 20, 17 and Matthew 28, 9? Mary came to the tomb, as we just read, and it was early morning, and, 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 and she, she looked in it, and it was empty, and she was crying, and the angel told her, say, hey, don't do that. You know what? He's, he's a rose, and, and everybody left, and, and Mary was sitting there trying to put everything together, and she turned around, and she thought that she had seen the gardener, and she said, where, where is he? Where's my Lord? And what did he say to her? Mary. And she said, Rabbi. And she fell and clung his feet. Guess what? You can't touch a spirit. And he said, why? Stop clinging to me, Mary. He said, you know what? I'll be around for a little bit. Stop clinging to me and go tell the folks about the resurrection, about I'm alive. Well, Not only that, but Jesus invited all the disciples to touch him in Luke 24, 39. He said, hey, touch me. He said, said, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. 
So that goes right into the second point. He had flesh and bones just like you and me. Right? John 21, 9 and 10 says this. So when they had gotten out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. You know what? You got to have hands to make a charcoal fire, right? You got to have hands to take the fish that they caught and place it on top of the charcoal fire to cook. John 21, 12 says this. He goes on. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus, what? First of all, when you read that account, Jesus was where? Standing on the seashore. To stand, you have to have what? Flesh and, blo and bones, Right? How about when he was walking on the Emmaus Road with um, the two disciples and they got to where they were at and he was preparing the food for them and when, when he was giving them the food, uh, they could see the nail prints in his wrists, flesh and blood. Jesus started a fire. He cooked breakfast. He gave an invitation. He instructed them. He ate with them. In fact, in Acts 10, 40, 41, Peter says this, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. What does that mean? It means that, you know what? We can see him. Not to all the people, but to the witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who, what, ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So there you go. So first, he was touched with human hands. Second, he had flesh and bones. Third, he ate physical food after the resurrection. Fourth, Jesus' body had the wounds. Thomas knew it. The disciples saw it. In fact, if you want to go beyond the resurrection and go into Revelation 1, 7, it even says, John says in the book of Revelation that behold, he's coming. The one who what? Man pierced. And you're going to see him come. Revelation 5, 6 says that the lamb was standing beside the throne of God who was slain. Physical wounds still with Jesus to this day to acknowledge the physical resurrection that will take place in the coming days. Fifth, Jesus' body was recognized, right? We talked about him being recognized up on the cross. That you know what? The soldiers had to recognize him. That Pilate had to recognize him. The disciples and his mothers recognized him. But in Matthew 28, 7, the angel said, Hey, disciples, go ahead and he will meet you there and you will see him. You know what? You have to see him. You're going to recognize him. Once again, physically, evidence of knowing that Jesus arose. Luke 24, 24, said, uh, it says where they laid him at. Where was that? In the tomb. People watched him. Joseph and Nicodemus laid him in the tomb. Mary and all her uh, other friends came and what? He was not in the tomb. Thomas once again seen and recognized him. They heard him, number six. Jesus could be seen and heard, right? They recognized, they seen and heard. They heard him, they worshiped him. Uh, they, were, they, they, they watched him as he came and spoke to them. And then number seven, the 
tomb was empty. Thank God. See, a lot of times we overlook that important evidence. The tomb is empty. Matthew 28, 6, the angel said it. Even in 24, in Luke 24, look, the tomb is empty. He is not here. I want you to think about it. As I said, the disciples, the soldiers, people watched as they laid him in the grave, right? In the tomb. He wasn't there when the disciples looked in it. In fact, Matthew 28, 11 through 15 says that the guards came to the religious leaders and the religious leaders said, here's some money, we'll take care of Pilate for you, but you tell everybody else that the body was stolen. You know what? That's pretty good evidence in itself, is it not? That the body's not there. Even the guards admitted to it. What does resurrection mean? It means out of the dead. That's what resurrection means. It means out of the dead. That's why he called Lazarus' name at Lazarus' tomb. If he would have just said, come forth, everyone around in those tombs would have come forth. But he specifically said, Lazarus, come forth. Out of the dead is what resurrection means. It's a physical resurrection. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, and he talks about the actual flesh. The Greek is soma. It, it's flesh. It means that this actual flesh will be raised again, and the soul and the body will be put back together. Right now, why? We're corruptible. There's sin in our body. But when Christ, when Christ raises us again to meet him in the air, then our, in, our corruptible bodies become incorruptible bodies. You see, the empty tomb, God displays his power to the world through the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to Scripture. Psalm 16 10 and 11 says this. David wrote this years before. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures. You know what? David even pointed to a physical resurrection before Christ ever resurrected. John 10, 17, 18, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiatives. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it back up again. This is the commandment that I received from my Father. You see, if Christ had not been raised from the dead then death would have never been defeated. Romans 6, 3 and 5 says this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? That's the, to signify why we come through the baptismal pool, right? Right? That's a testimony of saying what? That when we what? We're buried with Christ in baptism. That's the death. And we're raised to the newness of life. That's the resurrection. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we are united with him in death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see, folks, we will have a physical body in the resurrection. 
because our Lord and Savior had a physical body in the resurrection. He was recognizable. We will be recognizable. These old bodies will be put back together. You know what? The same God that created you, the same God that put you on this earth, when you die, even if you turn back to dust, or even if you're lost at sea, or even if you get burned up in, in some awful way, that same God is going to put you right back together in a glorified body so that you can spend eternity with him. Folks, my goodness, are y'all dead today? Because you know what? That's a contradiction of what we're here to celebrate. My goodness gracious. Absolutely hallelujah. That's the victory that we've won. That's why we are followers of Christ. That's why our faith is not in vain. That's what keeps us going each and every day through all the sorrows, through all the grief, through, through all the pains and the suffering is to know that we have victory in this life because our Savior lives. We'll have that physical body. He will raise this body up from being corruptible by sin and transform it into an incorruptible body, a glorified body, an eternal body to live with him forever. You see, here's what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. R.A. Torrey. If you don't know R.A. Torrey, he was, he learned a lot of things under D.L. Moody. He's a protege. And he said this, we will not be disembodied spirits in the world to come, but redeemed spirits in redeemed bodies in a redeemed universe. That's when he's going to come back and set it all straight. You say, yeah, Chris, but you know what? What happens to us now when we die? I've got a loved one in the grave. Well, if they're a believer... What does Paul say? Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That means our spirit, our soul goes to him. Is it recognizable? Yes, it is. Even in, even in the intermediate heaven, even in our intermediate bodies, we're still recognizable. I know that because of the transfiguration. There was Moses and Elijah there. Moses in the grave. Elijah taken up. But the disciples still knew who they were. That's why we all know who we are. Even when we leave this place and we go back and we reunite with our families and with the Lord until that time in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 when the trumpet sound sounds and the archangel blows it and he calls all the ones who are dead in him out of the grave to come meet him in the air where their souls and their body are going to reconnect and live with him forever. Hallelujah. That's what the resurrection's all about, folks. It's about the redemption, the full redemption, the full salvation that we have. Jesus Christ, the God-man, a historical person, walked on this earth, died on the cross, was buried. On the third day, he rose from the grave. He was touched. He was seen, he was heard, he ate, he was recognized not only by his disciples but by over 500 witnesses. Let me tell you something, folks. 500 witnesses you cannot have a hallucination about a risen Lord. In fact, it's practically impossible according to the odds that 500 people would have the same hallucination. 
(laughs) The resurrection gives us victory in knowing we are fully justified, fully sanctified, and fully glorified. We have a physical glorified body like Jesus, which is recognizable, can be seen, can be heard, and can be touched. Thought he was coming back. (laughs) This is why we have victory in the resurrection. This is why we have hope in Jesus Christ, y'all. You know, as, as we were singing just a minute ago, up from the grave he arose, he lives. I couldn't help but I, I was back there crying, really. <clears throat> because Easter was always my mom's favorite. Well, my whole family's, really, because they'd dress up in their Easter dresses and their little hats, and, you know, it, they would go to church and always sing those songs. Always. And I can remember from the time I was this tall hearing my mom sing up from the grave he arose. I could still hear her voice. I could still smell her. You know? And even though I didn't really realize what that was all about until I was a little bit older, folks, I know I will see her again. And I know that she will be in the same body, glorified body. And I'll get to live with her for all eternity. And I won't have to worry about it. Can I ask you, are you seeking the living one among the dead this morning? Is Jesus dead to you? I'm not just talking about today. I'm talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. January, February, March. Then we come back to, you know, Easter again. Is he just alive on Easter to you? I don't seek him, but on Easter. If you are, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to find him in the tomb. Many people have tried to disprove it. Many people have tried to, 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 to take every step they can to dispute, dispute, uh, disprove it. But what they end up doing, even the staunchest atheists, when they start getting into it, they come to Christ because they know the, uh, the evidence is overwhelming and they know that he lives. And they trust in him as their savior. If you ever want to read about it, read Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He was one of the biggest atheists that there ever were because of some things that happened in his life. If today the Lord is speaking to you, listen. Today's the day of salvation. Come and accept the invitation to life. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess my sins to you, and I repent of them. I trust Jesus as my Savior. I do believe he died for me, that he was buried and raised again on the third day, and I trust in him, and I receive him as my Savior. Simple as that. And then find a good Bible-believing church who teaches the Bible who teaches it and teaches what being a Christian is all about. Be baptized. That's your testimony, an inward change. It's an outward expression of an inward change. Let people know that you have trusted him. Christian, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or are you one of the two-thirds that don't believe that? What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you about this morning? Do you you have the joy in your life that this dark and dying world can see? Are you willing and ready to share the Savior's love with them? See, that's what we're charged to do. 
We're not just charged to come in here and sit on a Sunday and do nothing else, as Shay and Joseph even charged us today. We're supposed to be telling people about Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be answering their questions like these. Because if we do not do it, they will go somewhere on, somewhere else who will tell them the wrong story. We're charged to give an answer for the hope that lies within our hearts. The Bible doesn't need defended. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. People have questions about it. And God put you and me here, Christian, to defend that Bible and to defend his word. It's a lie and it can take care of itself. No. Jesus says in Isaiah 118, come let us reason. Come let us reason. You see, that's why people have, that's why our youth have so many questions. And parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, if you don't have the answer, somebody's going to lead them down the wrong road about the resurrection of Jesus Christ or about anything else. Here in a minute, we're going to come to the Lord's table. If you're here and you've said that prayer and you've trusted in Jesus Christ today, let me welcome you to the table. You can take that. You can take that communion. You know what? Jesus welcomes you to his table as a believer. Christian, maybe we need to evaluate and prepare our hearts before we come to his table. What's that table all about? It's remembering his death, his burial, and his resurrection, folks. It's not just the cross. We'll remember the victory he's given us. So, Christian, do you need to repent so that you can come to the table with a clean heart this, this morning? Is that you? If you do, uh, we're going to have this time of invitation. And, and, and the praise team is going to sing a special for our invitation that, that's not only the invitation, but it's going to get us prepared for communion also. It's called In Remembrance. Listen to the words. Go before the Lord so that you can come with us to the table.
when you came in, you should have received a cup with the bread and the wine in it or the juice. If you're having trouble opening it, would you just maybe pass it to somebody to your right or your left and allow them to help you do that? I know that sometimes it's hard to do with these. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks for it, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some of the bread, he gave thanks for it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And we thank you, Lord, for this resurrection day. Because, Lord, it reminds us of Good Friday and what you have done for us. Lord, we thank you for your body, for sacrifice. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come together and that we can, as a family, come to your table to partake of the bread. Lord, as we do it, may you be honored and may you be glorified in it. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they eaten. And he said, this is the blood. This is the cup which is poured out for you. And it's the new covenant in my blood. Father, thank you so much for the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for my sins. Thank you, Lord, for being that personal God who took my place. Thank you, Lord, for uh, shedding your blood so that we could have life. We just thank you, Lord, for that beautiful, precious sacrifice. It's in your name we pray, amen. He says, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. I want to thank you for being here this morning. I want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us here at WBC. I want to thank you for um, sharing in the Resurrection Day victory that we have. I trust that your day will be blessed as you spend it with family and friends. And I trust that as you go through the rest of this day and the rest of this week, that you'll understand that, you know what, when we do take communion, when we do come to that, the Lord's table, we're celebrating not only his death, but we're, we're, we're celebrating the victory of the resurrection too. And you know what, folks, that's a joyous occasion. So as you go through the rest of the week and in the coming months, continue to praise him for that. Would you all please stand as we dismiss uh, I want to invite you back next week. If you're visiting with us, come back next week. Um, it's a great place to worship. We've got a lot going on. Next week, we will be presenting a uh, worship leader candidate uh, to you for the next two weeks. And then on April 14th, we will be voting on that. So just be in prayer. Just uh, ask the Lord to guide you. Uh, and uh, I hope that you all have a great week. Father, thank you so much for this time together. I just thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, your compassion. And I thank you, Lord, that we could gather here together.
your people to be able to celebrate this resurrection day. I pray your many blessings upon each and every one here. I pray, Lord, that you would just give them a good day, that you'll watch over and protect them. I pray, Lord, that if a door is open for them to tell someone about this day and uh, who, who it's about, that, Lord, they'll walk right through that door and they will share uh, you with those folks. I just ask, Lord, that as we continue to go through the day, that we'll remember those who are uh, having trials and who are having uh, treatments and, and who are suffering, and Lord, who are sick. We just lift them up to you, too, and we just ask, Lord, that you would let them know uh, that they're being prayed for. So, Lord, thank you for the victory. Thank you for this day. Just pray, Lord, that you would just be honored and glorified in it, for it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.